Hello, my name is Neil Chuhong and I'm director of the Software Sustainability Institute. It's my great pleasure to be speaking to you virtually at the Bioinformatics Community Conference 2020 and to be one of the sponsors of this event. I'm going to be talking to you about research software and why the quality of research software has been in the news recently and why it's actually okay that most code is pretty terrible. So first of all, what is the Software Sustainability Institute? We're a national facility set up and funded by the UKRI in the United Kingdom to cultivate better, more sustainable research software to enable world-class research. What this means is that we are uh, providing a, a range of different resources to the wider community around expertise, services, tools, guidance and opportunities that help both developers and users of software uh, that's used in research to do and improve their practice. So what does this mean? Um, in essence, we help the community in different ways, both by providing consultancy to uh, different groups to improve the individual pieces of software they're using, by delivering training uh, on essential software skills in partnership with software carpentry, data carpentry, and other open source training uh, initiatives, bringing together people in the, their communities to address different topical issues, collecting data that can be used to help policymakers provide better um, processes and guidance and recommendations for how software should be used, and uh, disseminating the information that we collect through blogs, reports, and our website. But what I'm going to be talking to you today about is what code quality means for research software and what the experiences of the Institute have shown us um, works to help improve the quality. So let's start off with all software has bugs. So it's true that bugs are present in all real world software, whether that's software that's being produced in academia, or in industry. It doesn't matter if it's a research code or it's something that is a shrink wrapped product that's being sold in a shop. The chances are is that there'll be a bug in it somewhere. And when we talk about how to get rid of software bugs using software engineering, we need to think about it like we think of pest control. The best way of dealing with software bugs is to try and put in place control measures, catch the bugs early on, and whatever you do, try not to make sure that they, you leave them to multiply because it's much more costly to remove the bugs later on in the process. Sometimes bugs can lay dormant for years, waiting for the right moment to, beat, to bite you. Um, a good example of this is the Heartbleed bug, which was present in one of the major open source um, security tools for years. And it's made even more challenging when you consider that most software is no longer just um, available on its own. It depends on many different layers uh, and even scientific software has a large stack of different dependencies all the way from the programming language through the numerical and mathematical libraries uh, up to the applications and the individual workflows that might be run on top of them. So if all software has bugs, what are the challenges for research software? And what do we mean by research software? So when I talk about research software, I am talking about the specialist software that's used to generate, process, analyze, visualize data. It's the things we do to use um, in our research. And most people use some form of research software. A study we did in 2014 showed that about seven out of 10 people um, were dependent on a specialist piece of research, uh, research software to do their research. They couldn't do research without software. However, in many cases, people's impressions of research software are more similar to, to this cartoon, where it's a piece of software that's been handed down through generations of supervisors and students with very little documentation and very few instructions for how to use it. However, um, given that we're at uh, the Bioinformatics Community Conference, I'm sure that most of you 
are much better at doing software than this example, but there are still problems. Um, the main issue is that writing good code is not easy. At the Software Sustainability Institute, we have worked with many, many excellent software engineers, research software engineers, researchers, who are doing an amazing job of creating high quality software. But this isn't easy. You have to make trade-offs somewhere. And often the trade-off that you make is um, being rewarded for doing maintenance on your software. It's often said that the IT industry does things better, but they do this better because they have better resources, better training and better incentives. The key thing here is that the software industry's business is software. Whereas when we talk about research software, our business is research. So in some sense, software has always been a byproduct of research, even though now we know that it's a fundamental part. So what, what does this mean? The COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused this particular conference to go online, is a really good case study in understanding what happens when research software is put under pressure. In the UK, one of the main pieces of software used to help inform policymakers in the UK government was produced by a group at Imperial College, um, and it's called COVIDSIM. It's a micro simulation model that lets you see the effects of different interventions. And this is a piece of code that has been developed over many different years. It's probably about a decade old. Um, originally not made openly available, but at the start of the pandemic, it was published with the help of people from the GitHub team in Microsoft. And so this is an amazing thing. Here we can see on GitHub a piece of code that's being used to help influence um, public policy. So this is a really good thing for research software. Challenge is that there are always bugs in research software. And so here's an example of one of the bugs that was found initially in the COVID sim simulation. Uh, a team that was um, commissioned by the Royal Society went in to look at the reproducibility of this code and noticed that there were some differences, uh, even starting off with the same initial parameters. So again, this is a great thing in general. Um, by opening up the code, what we had was a group of people able to look in and uh, examine the code and make it better and contribute back. The challenge here is in that opening up your code like this, you start getting people criticizing it for the wrong reasons. And what we saw with the case of the COVID sim code is that it quickly gained the attention of software engineers from all around the world. And in many cases, they were really shocked by the quality of the coding um, that was in this code. And here is one of the big challenges of being someone who develops research software. The problem is, is that generally speaking, the code that you produce is being used by yourself and your close collaborators. You don't expect it to suddenly be thrust into the limelight uh, by a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. And so a lot has been written over the last few months around what should the quality of research software be? Should we be applying professional practices from the IT industry? Should we be looking at producing practices that are um, more in line with what is expected from researchers and their peers? Should it be something new? Should it be something different? Uh, and so we've seen people such as the British Computer Society take an interest, looking at understanding how we might professionalize uh, coding and scientific research, and organizations such as CodeCheck, looking at the reproducibility of these codes. All of this points to the real crisis in research software. And that is that in a crisis like this one, there isn't time for the people who develop the software to fix the bugs that are present in it. In an ideal world, all research software would be developed with strong software engineering processes from the start. But generally speaking in research, we don't know which codes will be useful at the point where we first start developing them. Only over time, 
and perhaps just through luck and depending on what crisis hits us, that we know which codes are going to be required to be used for a much higher impact uh, set of use cases. And so sometimes software developed as a byproduct of a PhD will become the flagship code for an area. However, most of this software won't. Most software will stay at the level of being used by a single person to deal with a single problem, perhaps just for a single paper. And here's the big issue. Software development is expensive and it isn't a publication, so there's no incentive to improve code. So how do we deal with this crisis? So at the Software Sustainability Institute, the things that we have been doing have been around culture change, working from the bottom up. And what this means is that our vision of the world is making everything a little bit better. So we want code to be improved slightly because making mistakes is part of the learning. So our vision of the world is that everyone is able to develop code that is slightly more um, reusable, slightly cheaper to build on, slightly easier to improve. And as long as we ensure that code is continuously improved so that as it becomes used by more and more people and more and more um, different groups, uh, that improvement continues, then we will always have code that is at the quality level that is appropriate for the people using it. So there are three things that we think are really important here, and they're all around openness and collaboration. One of these is being able to publish your software openly and publish it early, because that helps bring in new collaborations, allows you to get feedback, and allows you to improve trust. Another thing is championing training for researchers in your area. So ensure that the students and early career researchers that you work with are given the time and opportunity to develop their computational skills. Because now, unlike 10 years ago, there are many, many initiatives, in, such as the Carpentries um, and many others, that provide high quality training resources in this area for free. And finally, reuse rather than reinventing. What we would like to see is people building just the part of the software functionality that's unique to their research. We have a lot of really great platforms and libraries um, in Python, in R and other languages that allow us to do most of the common functionality that we need to do our research. So use these, contribute back to them and help focus the limited maintenance effort on ensuring that we have uh, a set of commonly used libraries and platforms alongside small pieces of additional software that's developed by individual researchers. So just in finishing, um, I'd like to kind of pass on one little bit of wisdom. Um, I've always found that the best way of finding bugs in your code is to give it to one of your colleagues, whether that's a collaborator, a student, another person working in your team. Trying to explain your own code or have someone else run it is the easiest way of finding bugs and improving the quality in your code. However, the other thing to remember is in most cases, you're doing this for yourself. And the next best way is just realizing how little you know about your code after coming back from a holiday. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope that you managed to take some of this information on and champion training and championing open publishing in your own areas. And I hope that you have a great conference and continue to develop brilliant software. Thank you very much.